remember back in 2001, um, a bit of history, uh, President George Bush, George W. Bush banned federal funding of, of research on newly created embryonic stem cell lines. This was the first point at which I really became aware of stem cell therapy. Um, and in 2004, that, that sort of probably followed on from that, uh, the California Stem Cell Agency was created after California voters approved Proposition 71, um, which was to fund in-state stem cell research um, directed toward cures. Um, just a couple of years after that, Shinya Yamanaka, who, by the way, was uh, had had a lab at Gladstone Institutes affiliated with UCSF, um, described how to reprogram somatic cells to become induced plurip pluripotent stem cells, uh, for which he later won the Nobel Prize along with John Gurdon. Um, and the deal with pluripotent stem cells is that they can propagate indefinitely and generate cell, uh, cell types for any tissue in the body, which makes them incredibly promising as, as uh, cell replacements for defective cells that, that cause devastating diseases. Um, but we have immune systems for a reason, um, which is to reject foreign biological material. So uh, how do you get these stem cell therapies into the body to cure these, these terrible diseases? Um, without inducing an immune reaction, which is why we've uh, invited uh, Dr. Sonia Schrepfer, um, who's head of hypoimmune platform at Sano Biotech, also an adjunct professor. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, these are just the current titles I have for you. Um, adjunct professor at UCSF in the Department of Surgery, in which she also directs the Transplant and Stem Cell Immunobiology Lab and founder of Transplant and Stem Cell Immunobiology Lab at Stanford. Uh, Sonia received her MD and PhD degrees from the universities of Würzburg and Hamburg, where she was awarded the Heisenberg professorship for her work to understand the immune barrier in st stem cell biology for regenerative medicine. Sonia and her team subsequently decreased the immunogenic potential of stem cells to generate hypoimmunogenic tissues and organs, work that was funded by CIRM and NIH, among other sources. Um, we're really happy to have you, uh, Dr. Schrepfer. Please tell us all about um, hypoimmune stem cell therapies. Thank you so much, Kasper. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, so I start with my disclosure slide, but um, it was already correctly um, said everything. So I am at Sana Biotechnology at the moment and Achen Professor at UCSF. Um, I wanted to start really in the early days to show you the whole journey in that field uh, because I'm now at SANA, but it's not that we just started the last two years to work in that field. We started much earlier in the early 2000s to, to do that work. And my background is in solid organ transplantation. I was trained in Germany and Munich by um, a cardiac surgeon to do cardiac transplantations. And I got frustrated because the surgery itself seems to be really easy, but the hard part starts afterwards when the organ gets rejected and how to control the immune system of the patient. So I decided back then to leave the clinical field and to really focus on the immune part and understanding the mechanisms of rejection. And um, I moved from Germany to Stanford in 2005. And that was an exciting time because as Kaspar said, um, the human embryonic stem cells um, were available back then. And I remember that we had stickers on the centrifuges, which were not, um, uh, supported by federal funding and that allowed us to work with the human embryonic stem cells. The work I show you today in the slide deck was all done with iPSC, so induced pluripotent stem cells, that we wouldn't have to deal with those ethical issues there with the embryonic stem cells. So that's to the background. And this slide here is quite old. Uh, that was really the early work um, around 2006, 2007, when we used um, back then pluripotent stem cells. So we started with the human embryonic and then later we repeated it with iPSCs and we wanted to understand how those cells get rejected. And in these days, uh, the field was um, discussing that pluripotent stem cells, because they are so early in their development that they wouldn't get recognized by the immune system after transplantation and therefore rejection wouldn't be a problem. So in the early days, uh, we looked into that and we tried to understand if they do get rejected and which immune cells are responsible for that. And this slide shows you an experiment where we just transplanted pluripotent stem cells into different mouse strains 
with different immune cell populations to understand uh, that immune hurdle and to identify it better. And what we learned um, back then was that if you transplant into a mouse with a complete immune system, so that mouse has functional T cells and B cells, that's what we call adaptive immune cells. So they recognize the foreign antigen and if it's foreign, they would start rejecting immediately. And this mouse also has innate cells, the NK cell population. And K cells are usually um, looking for virus-loaded uh, cells, for example, to clear them. So it's a different um, in, um, defense mechanism of the human body. And what we learned, when the mouse has all immune cells intact, those mice are capable of rejecting pluripotent stem cells. So it, it showed us clearly that pluripotent stem cells, although they are early in the development, they do get recognized by immune cells and they do get rejected. And you see here within five days uh, that the transplanted cells were rejected here in an assay where we basically monitored survival of the transplanted cells. When we then transplanted them into a different mouse strain with no T cells, but functional B and NK cells, we saw that only two out of nine mice were checked. And that showed us for the first time that the T cell population seems to be the major contributor in this allograft rejection of pluripotent stem cells. Then we use different models. I just show one more here, the peripheral knockout mice, where uh, you see the mice do have T cells and B cells. They don't have functional NK cells. And you see those mice are capable of rejecting the graft. And the reason why I put this slide in is to show you that the first step for us was just the understanding what is happening. And we clearly identified the T cell population, so the adaptive immune system as responsible for um, the major rejection of the graft. So in our next step, what we did is uh, we started thinking about what antigens are responsible to trigger a T cell response or an adaptive immune response? And we tried with genetic engineering to knock these um, molecules out. Or back then, you see that it was published 2011, but we started working on it around 2008. Back then, we didn't have CRISPR-Cas9 technology available. So what we did is, in order to control the T cells, we said we want to wipe off the fingerprint of our pluripotent stem cells um, that we can um, then um, see if the T cells, if they don't see the fingerprint, they shouldn't react and we would overcome the T cell uh, rejection barrier. So what we did is we knocked the fingerprint, the HLA class one molecule down and we used a silence RNA and to fire at Stanford um, back then had the lab and uh, he had developed the silence RNA. So we tried to learn from the technology and we combined it with an intra body that we put into the endoplasmatic reticulum of the cells. And whenever the MHC molecule would get assembled, the intra body should pull it down and it shouldn't go to the cell surface and show something foreign to the immune system of the recipient. And this technology, kind of worked to knock down the fingerprint, but it never worked to completely have a knockout. So what you see in that graph is in red, this is the fingerprint, the HLA-1 molecule, and you see it goes down and then it stays down quite for a while. And that showed us for the very first time that gene editing is possible in the cells, but we would need better technology or modify the molecules to really achieve knockouts of the fingerprint and then overcome the T cell barrier. So the idea that then came out of those experiments was we want to have one healthy iPSC donor. So these are pluripotent stem cells we generate from one person out of, for example, skin cells or blood cells. And this one iPSC line, we want to um, make hypoimmune that we evade the recognition of the immune system when we transplant this line into any patient. So the goal is really to have a very well characterized master bank that we can transplant that. Um, it's easy to manufacture. Um, we have good quality controls because it's only one cell line you have to, to the QC. And in the patient, the goal is immunosuppression free, so no immune rejection. And to provide the technology um, really to anyone, anytime and anywhere. 
So with this goal in mind and the first experiments we did understanding that that fingerprint and the T cells are the main barrier uh, in that transplantation, we looked into nature and we wanted to understand where in nature do we have a situation that there is an allo graft, that means um, basically a graft with surface proteins from another person, but the graft is surviving. And that is in fetal maternal tolerance during pregnancy. Because during pregnancy, half of the proteins of the fetus are from the father. So the mother's immune system doesn't uh, know those proteins and sees them as foreign and would in theory, start to reject the fetus. But pregnancy works, we know that um, because of the evolution and um, we try to understand those molecules. We know that the mother's immune system is seeing the proteins or the antigens, but it's not rejecting the fetus. And uh, we spent um, many, many years in understanding those single molecules. And the goal was to identify the fewest number of those molecules we would need to create a hypoimmune cell product that we then could transplant into any patient without immunorejection. And what you see here on the right side is really the basic principle we learned. And that is that on an allogenic cell, so our iPSC donor product, um, that cell does have a fingerprint. So all of our cells have it. That's how our immune system um, distinguished between foreign and own, and it would immediately reject and foreign fingerprints. So that fingerprint, those are the HLA molecules. And we do know that those HLA molecules, they trigger T cell responses, and that leads to killing of those cells. But what we also know is at the same time, this fingerprint is inhibiting the other immune cell population, the innate cells, the NK cells and the macrophages. And um, by connecting with the NK cells, it's inhibiting the NK cells and there is no killing. So it's a killing molecule for the adaptive immunity, but protective for the innate. So by now wiping off that fingerprint, that's what you see here on the right side, we can easily overcome that hurdle of T cell recognition and B cell recognition. But now we have the problem that the NK cells are not inhibited anymore. And then K cells would kill those allergenic cells with the missing self immediately. The reason for that is in nature, when we have, for example, a virus infection, the virus is knocking down the HLA molecules and innate cells like NK cells, they're um, permanently looking for cells with a missing self where the fingerprint is not there and they're triggered to kill them. That's how, for example, we can clear um, and virus loaded cells. So the, the goal was we needed to understand which molecules we need to now control the NK cell hurdle. Um, to, and if we would overcome this, we most likely would have a product uh, that could be transplanted without immunosuppression. And over the years, we had studied many different molecules um, to inhibit these NK cells. So what I show you here, are videos. Um, and in these videos, the green cells, you see here the dots, those are cells where we had removed the HLA, so they're HLA negative. And then we overexpressed molecules that were discussed or thought of inhibiting innate cell killing. And that is HLA E on the left or HLA G. We also overexpressed PDL1 or CD47 here on the right. And then we put NK cells, these are the little gray round structures here into that cell culture. And we wanted to see which of those molecules is able to inhibit the NK cell killing that is triggered by the missing cell. And um, I start the video. The overall video is like six hours. And what you see during that time frame is that when we overexpress the molecule called CD47, that the stimulated and K cells that are sensing the missing self and they see there is no fingerprint, they're still not attacking. So CD47 seems to block that killing of the NK cells. So therefore the data I show you today are cells, iPSC cells where we wiped off the fingerprint, the HLA class one and the class two with a genetic knockout. Um, and here we use the CRISPR-Cas9 um, technology for the data I show you. And then we overexpressed CD47 
to inhibit the NK cell killing at the macrophages. And the idea is that these iPSCs, you could now differentiate into any cell type you're interested in. Um, I have four examples here, the T cells, beta islet cells, cardiomyocytes, or clear progenitors, and to provide off-the-shelf therapies and transplant those cells now without immunosuppression into any patient who needs them um, at any time and anywhere. And uh, what I thought today is that I put together the slides where we already then use differentiated cells. So we have lots of data characterizing the iPSCs in mice and humanized mice, but I think the differentiated cell data are very interesting and I thought um, I would like to share them with you today. So the first um, data set you see here is we differentiated those cells into cardiomyocytes. And we are here on this slide in a mouse model. So these are mouse iPSCs and we differentiated them into mouse cardiomyocytes. And when we do that, um, usually the mouse reacts with an immune rejection because the cardiomyocyte is from a different mouse. And you see that here in red, this is a T cell assay and the red bar here is quite high. The blue is the background of that assay. That is basically the transplantation of the cell in the way into the very same mouse. So that's like an identical twin. There is no immune rejection. And you see cardiomyocytes get recognized by the immune system because of the fingerprint, high T cell activation. The next assay here is an antibody binding assay. So that shows you the B cells or then plasma cells produce a lot of antibodies. So the red is much higher than the blue. On the bottom, these are the so-called hypoimmune cardiac cells. So here we had used mouse iPSCs with an HLA or MHC class one, class two knockout and CD47 overexpression. And what you see now is that the red graph is in, in the background of the blue. So it is basically, it gives you the similar response like when you would get your own cells into your body. So it shows you that those cardi cardiac cells are able to evade the immune recognition. Uh, we then wanted, of course, to show that in a disease model. So we used the mice, we created a myocardial infarction, and then we injected either the cardiomyocytes, which we didn't do any gene edits, or the hypoimmune cardiomyocytes that's, or cardiac cells. That's what you see here on the right. And what you see in balloon sense imaging is we can visualize those cells. And on day zero, you see what we transplanted, and over time, the signal when the cells get rejected because they are unmodified disappears. And the blue graphs here, they show you each single mouse. You, basically you see that each mouse rejects cardiomyocytes if they're not hypoimmune. But on the right side, you see when we transplant hypoimmune cardiomyocytes, the immune system doesn't see the cells, it's immune evasion. And the cardiomyocytes, they are surviving. The follow-up I have here in the picture is 28 days. We then looked if we improve the cardiac function in those mice and we performed pressure volume um, assays. So what you see, uh, pressure volume loops, what you see on the X axis is the volume the heart is pumping. And on the Y axis, you see the pressure. The black loops show you an healthy heart. So you see the heart is pumping out volume, and we are measuring the volume that is basically in the heart after the blood got ejected. And you see on the y-axis, the pressure the heart can, can build up. When we are now performing myocardial infarction, you see that the volume increases in the heart because the, um, the, the pump function is decreased and you see the pressure goes down. But when we transplanted hypoimmune cardiac cells, that's what you see here in red, you see that the loop goes back to the left. So more volume gets pumped out of the heart and you see the pressure goes up. The heart is able to, to have an increased pressure. And it's really hard to study engraftment or uh, regeneration in mice. Uh, but what we wanted to show here with the data is really a proof of concept that if the hypoimmune cardiac cells survive in the heart, that they can contribute to regeneration. Um, then another model um, we did, and all those data uh, were done at UCSF, is that um, we put 
endothelosomes into mice. And what happened, what was quite intriguing when we saw that is we transplanted those endothelial cells into a mice. And first we were interested, do they survive? And they did survive. But what we then saw is that they're not only surviving, they are functional as endothelial cells. And that's what you see here in the histopathology. After two weeks, you see in blue the nuclei of, of the cells. In red, you see um, VE catarin, um, that is a marker for endothelial cells. And in green, luciferase, that's the enzyme we overexpressed in our transplanted cells. So whatever is green, you know, those are the cells we put into the mice. And what they started around two weeks, but much more obvious around three and four weeks is that they um, started to form those wings, those premature vessel structures. And then later we even found um, erythrocytes in those vessel structures, what you see as uh, pink wings. So what we then thought is if they're not only surviving, but they seem to function as endothelial cells, can we use that in a disease model to, to cure mice with a certain disease and we pick the hind limb ischemia model. So what you do in that model is that you remove the blood flow and here in this case on the left leg of the mouse to the foot. So these are Doppler um, perfusion images and you see on the left leg here, there's no blood flow. Blood flow would look like here on the right that you have this red, um, a tube or a line to the foot. Um, and what we did is we removed the whole artery. So we knew there is no blood uh, flow to the foot. Then we transplanted wild type, so unmodified endothelial cells. And as expected, they did get rejected because they were allogenic. And eventually we couldn't rescue the limb of the mouse. And this is a model to study, for example, in patients, peripheral artery disease. Um, so those patients usually need amputation, they lose um, their leg. But when we transplanted now hypoimmune iPSC derived endothelial cells, we saw on day one the same picture. We had removed the artery, there is no blood flow. After day seven, you see here it starts to look very chaotic, a lot of color, but not very organized or structured at all. Around day 14, the same. And then around day 21, day 28, if you look, there's blood flow to the limb. So the blood flow is restored and we basically preserved um, the limb so that the mice didn't lose the limb. And that showed us in another disease model that hypoimmune cells regenerated are not only surviving and evading the immune response, they're capable of treating in a mouse disease model the disease. So all the data I showed you so far, they were generated in UCSF when I was at UCSF full time. Um, we then started, um, I then started to do the work at, at SANA Biotechnology. And uh, going forward now, all the other slides will be the work um, I did at SANA Biotechnology since I joined in 2019. Um, so this these data here show you now on fields um, we are very interested in, and that is using the hypoimmune idea for CAR T cell therapy. And the idea is that you would create an allogenic CAR T cell, basically off the shelf, that you could use in any patient in any hospital um, to, to cure cancer. And the model I show you here is a CD19 model. So the tumor expresses CD19 and the CAR T cells that were generated are against CD19. So they, they see the tumor and the idea is that those CAR T cells are killing the tumor. And um, the question we had here is, um, do those three hypoimmune edits, the HLA class one knockout, class two knockout and the C47 knock-in, do they alter the activity or the function of the CAR T cells? So these mice here are NSG mice. They received a tumor, the NAM6 tumor. And you see on day zero, the tumor is, every, um, is mainly in the lungs of, of those mice. But then by day 27, you see the tumor is everywhere. The whole mice is, they are wet. When we transplant unmodified CAR T cells, the CAR T cells are against the CD19, so they they do see the tumor and you see they're killing, they're clearing the tumor in those mice. And when we are using hypoimmune CAR T cells, what you see is that the tumor clearance looks comparable to the unmodified CAR T cells. 
And that is an indication, was a first indication for us that those three hypoimmune edits are not impacting um, the CAR T cell function. When we then started the immune response, um, we saw in those mice that humanized mice, when they received unmodified CAR T cells, which are allogenic, they're from a different donor, the mice react with T cell activation, very high blue graph. But the hypoimmune CAR T cells here, they stay in the background. So also for the CAR T cells, the hypoimmune CAR T cells, they evade the immune recognition by the recipient. And uh, we also have here some antibody binding assays. So again, the unmodified CAR T cells, you see antibody binding, but they're not binding to the hypoimmune CAR T cells. We paid a lot of attention to the innate immune cells. Um, and what you see here are in case cell killing assay, where we had a CAR T cell, where we just knocked out the HLA or MHC class one, class two molecule. And you see that is immediately killing by NK cells because the fingerprint is missing. When we overexpress on the CAR T cells, the CD47, you see the screen line stays up and the cells are not killed by NK cells. When we are now blocking the anti-CD47 with a an blocking antibody, you see the signaling to the NK cells doesn't work anymore. And now we see killing again. So that shows you the relevance uh, in that model for CAR T cells as well of the CD47 molecule to inhibit the NK cell killing. So what we then did at SANA was um, the goal, of course, is um, to, um, to translate the technology into the patient. So we said, uh, we see now it works in certain mouse disease models, the ones I shared today, but um, the goal is really the, the patient. So we were aiming for a higher bar translational model and we choose the non-human primate model. The non-human primate model from the immune perspective is a very high bar because the immune system of those prim um, non-human primates is uh, very reactive. So what we did is um, we had two different groups. The green cohort here had four NHPs and we had used here unmodified allogenic iPSCs, that means from another monkey. And we transplanted those into the muscle of the monkeys. And after six weeks, we then transplanted hypoimmune iPSCs into the very same monkeys. And then the vice versa experiment is cohort two, first receives hypoimmune iPSCs. And then after six weeks, we transplanted unmodified iPSCs. And we really wanted to understand um, the immunobiology around it. And what those data show you, these are the immune data first, um, is that in the top row, when we transplanted unmodified iPSCs, allogenic from one monkey into the other, what we see is pre-TX, that means before we transplanted the cells, there is no T cell activation. The reason is because the monkey T cells hasn't seen the antigen yet, so they don't, they are not activated. But one week, what we label with one W, one week after the transplantation, you see a huge increase in T cell activation. And then the T cell activation over time declines. It never goes below the background um, and that of course, um, for the follow-up we have here was kind of expected because the T cells, they build memory that if you would now inject the very same cells the second time, the T cells could even react more potent and faster. So um, the blue um, graphs stay up. However, on day on six weeks, what we here labeled day zero for the red group, for the hypoimmune group, what uh, we have the red arrow there, uh, what you see is the hypoimmune cells also, the T cells know the antigen, they are sensitized. They don't recognize that we transplant hypoimmune. There is no T cell activation against the hypoimmune cells, which is kind of easy to achieve because we wiped off the fingerprint. So there is nothing the T cell can see. For the antibody production, we see similar data. Um, when we transplant unmodified allogenic iPSCs, you see after one week, high IgM antibody response, it declines. And what happens is after two weeks, the IgM antibodies, they switch to the IgG and that's what you see in those monkeys. So that shows you the monkey immune system is reacting like we expected in a transplant patient. But what you also see is that when we transplant the hypoimmune cells, when we have the red arrow, there's no de novo antibody production. You see the red 
crafts, they stay down. And I think the most exciting data are here under the IgG antibody production, because what you see is after six weeks, when we transplant hypoimmune cells, these monkeys have really high, still very high levels of IgG antibodies. So that means those monkeys are sensitized. They know the antigen and still there is no de novo IgG antibody production. And that shows us that we can think about redosing hypoimmune cell transplants and we can think about um, going into sensitized patients. That could be, for example, a patient with autoimmune disease like type 1 diabetes. What we learned from those experiments on the bottom is these are the four NHPs that received the hypoimmune iPSCs. And what you see is that there is no movement when we transplanted hypoimmune and T cell activation, no antibody production for IgM or IgG. But six weeks later, when we now transplant the unmodified iPSCs, the immune system recognizes them as foreign and starts to react with T cell activation, IgM antibody production with the blue graphs up, and IgG antibody production. And that shows you that the hypoimmune transplantations we did before does not immunosuppress those recipients. Um, the immune system of those NHPs is capable of mounting a normal immune response to the unmodified um, allogenic iPSCs we transplanted. And um, the innate immune response is really something we are studying in detail. And uh, what you see here are the killing data out of those NHPs for the macrophages on the left and the NK cells on the right. The top row is just a control showing you that when we wipe off the fingerprints, so no HLA-1 or 2, um, that the cells get killed by macrophages and NK cells. But when we overexpress the CD47, you see here the green line stays up. There is no killing by macrophages, nor by NK cells. And we can reverse that by blocking the CD47. Then you see macrophages and NK cells are killing. And what is exciting for us, we did for the first time, is that we had labeled the stem cells we put into those monkeys and we could follow them in vivo in the living monkey over time. So what you see here are the images from the first cohort, uh, the four NHPs that had received first the unmodified iPSCs and rejected them. So on day zero, you see in this colorful areas, the transplanted iPSCs, they are all there. But within three weeks, you see that the signal disappeared. Those cells got rejected. If you look here on the right side, what I labeled with summary, the blue line that shows you those monkeys we imaged every week. And we could um, show that um, the crafts get rejected within two to three weeks. And then we did a retransplant of the hypoimmune um, iPSCs into the very same sensitized uh, recipient. And you see on day zero, all the stem cells are there. And those stem cells are so one. Also, the very same monkey rejected the unmodified ones before. And you see here pictures four weeks after or eight weeks after the, the transplantation and in red here, when you look at the graphs, these are the individual follow-ups uh, when we measured every week. So this is quite exciting because the recipients are not immunosuppressed and we are transplanting those hypoimmune cells into a very sensitized um, immune system. The other group of monkeys received first the, the hypoimmune iPSCs. And you see on day zero, the signal is nicely there. Here we show the follow-up for four months in two monkeys, or you see pictures of five weeks and two, and two other monkeys. And on the right side, what is in, in red, you see those are the hypoimmune iPSCs. So they do survive and even here uh, proliferate in vivo without immunosuppression. And when we now transplant after six weeks, unmodified iPSCs in blue, you see they do get rejected very fast. So while that monkey's immune system is rejecting the unmodified ones, the blue lines go down fast, the hypoimmune still don't get recognized by the immune system and they evade the immune recognition and they persist and survive during that time. So the data what we have generated um, over the, those many years is uh, really, um, that hypoimmune cells with the three edits I showed you can evade allogenic immune rejection. I showed you mouse data, we had humanized data and the NHP data. 
and they do not activate the missing self-response by macrophages or NK cells. They can be transplanted into sensitized recipients that opens now the opportunity for redosing or diseases where patients are sensitized. And they're not altering the recipient's immune system. So this was for us very exciting. These are brand new data uh, because it hasn't been shown in an NHP model before with autoimmune suppression than an allogenic graft survivors. And thus we think the cellular transplantation without immune suppression appears to be an achievable goal uh, with the hypoimmune cells. And what we are currently doing, Sana is moving directly into the hypoimmune engineered cell therapy programs for the T cells for pancreatic islets and for cardiac cells. So this is uh, my last slide showing you that those three hypoimmune edits are not impairing the cell differentiation. So we show you here an example for cardiac cell differentiation or islet cell differentiation. The upper row are unmodified human iPSCs. The bottom row are hypoimmune. And we could differentiate them as well as the unmodified iPSC. So meaning that those three edits are not impacting um, the cell differentiation. And with that, I would like to end my talk and um, answer any questions you have. Thank you. Great. Well, it's uh, top of the hour. Thank you very much, uh, Sonia. Mm -hmm. I, I think, well, I certainly appreciate it. I know everybody else did. And, and best of luck at Sana, what you're doing Thank in the you. future. Thank you Thank very you. much for inviting me, Kasper. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome. Bye.